question was for the um, duty was to talk about COVID-19 and then I said well there will not be all that much uh, probability and he said that is all right. I think you will have more probability when you're the second and third uh, talks by Amory and Emmanuel. Uh, and I could also say that I have done work on epidemic spreading models, which include quite a bit of uh, probability. For instance, now I'm finalizing a paper together with Frank Ball, where we look at uh, uh, an epidemic spreading on a network, a social network, where we have uh, preventive measures in the sense that if you're connected to someone who is infected, then you uh, either drop that edge with a certain probability or you rewire the edge to another randomly chosen individual. And that model has some interesting features in particular, if you fix all parameters except that you increase the transmission rate when you hit the threshold value such that the basic reproduction number is one, then actually the final size makes a discontinuous jump there we can prove. So uh, below threshold, uh, no one gets infected and just above threshold, it could be 50 or 80% that get infected. But that's a different story and a different talk. So today I will talk uh, uh, first some general stuff about basic reproduction number and effective reproduction numbers. And then towards the end, I will present a new result together with Frank Ball and Peter Trapman. Frank Ball is in Nottingham, Peter Trapman is at Stockholm University. And I can say that this paper is uh, very close to being uh, accepted by science. We have not gotten the formal acceptance letter yet, but we have signed a lot of documents, the license form, the ethics form, the public forms, and uh, so many forms. So I would be a little bit disappointed if we at the end uh, will not get accepted. So that is uh, fun, I think. Now to the talk, let's see if I can move slides here. Yeah, all right. Um, and if there is something uh, uh, which I say, which is very unclear, I think you can uh, uh, write in the chat uh, and then someone will interrupt me, but otherwise I welcome questions also after the talk. So, uh, we consider uh, an infectious disease spreading in a large community. So all results will be assuming a large community. We have an infectious disease, which I call of SIR type, meaning that uh, at first individuals are susceptible. They might get infected. If they do so, they are infectious for a while. And after that period, they recover. And important assumption is that when you recover, you're immune for the rest of the study period. You so let's think that we consider one year and what happens in a year and then you assume that you're immune for the all that uh, period if um, you might your immunity might wane several years later but that's not of relevance here i think uh, some of you have heard about epidemic models and a feature with close to all of them is that the initial phase of a stochastic epidemic model uh, is that you can approximate it by a branching process. Uh, and why is that? Well, the difference between the epidemic and a branching process is that after a while, when people get infected, if you have infectious contact with others, then you might uh, have an infectious contact with someone that has already been infected. And then uh, uh, the epidemic process is different from the branching process. But in the beginning, in a large community, uh, you sort of live in a sea of susceptibles. So it's very unlikely that in the beginning that you will have an infectious contact uh, with uh, someone that has been infected earlier. This is true unless you have some local structures. So for instance, if you have households, even if few people are infected in the whole uh, a community, it could very well happen that some of your household members have been infected before you. So then those type of models are harder to analyze. Uh, similarly, if you introduce spatial aspects, uh, the same thing could happen that your neighbors have been infected before you if you were infected by uh, another neighbor. So in most of what I talked today, uh, I will neglect these type of heterogeneities, but I will consider other types of heterogeneities. For instance, uh, 
variable susceptibility or variable degree of social activity, but not local structures in today's talk. There is quite a lot of work on that uh, by others and also me a little bit, but today I will not talk about that. So let's start with the simplest case. By the way, I gave this talk yesterday for the biostat department at Peking University. So the level is low in terms of probability. Otherwise it would not have been accessible to them. So let's start with the homogeneous case. Uh, I would say that uh, there are two key quantities, both for the homogeneous case, but also for the heterogeneous case or heterogeneous models. The most important quantity of all is uh, called the basic reproduction number. In a homogeneous case, its interpretation is very easy. It is the average number of infectious contacts an individual has during its infectious period. And what is an infectious contact, of course, depends on what type of disease you consider. And many, in many situations, it's not a uniquely defined thing for COVID-19. Maybe it is that you have been in proximity with someone uh, for more than uh, a few minutes. Uh, that type of thing is sometimes defined as a, a, an infectious contact. If you're interested in sexually transmitted infections, then a, a, a contact is more clearly defined. It's a sexual intercourse. It's very important to have in mind that R0 not only depends on the infectious agent, but also on the community in which it spreads. So I get a little bit disappointed when people say, what is R0 for COVID-19? I think the, the question you should pose is, what is R0 for COVID-19 in this region? Because it clearly is different in different regions. The most important quantity uh, is that uh, if R0 is uh, larger than one, there is a possibility of a big outbreak, whereas if R0 is smaller than or equal to one, uh, that is not true. So R0 is the mean of the offspring distribution. So this corresponding result applies, is taken from branching process theory. Another important quantity is called the generation time distribution. So R0 is a real number, but the generation time distribution is a distribution. So it uh, describes a random variable, which you might call capital G, and this is the time between getting infected and infecting others. And of course, it's not the same every time you get infected. So it has a, it's a random uh, variable. Perhaps it can be described by a, by a PDF or if, uh, something else. So for instance, uh, thanks to Peter Jorgers, but also others, uh, there are a lot of results that you can use from branching process theory uh, to state things about the epidemic, if this epidemic, uh, if the community is large. So there are limiting results saying that as the population size tends to infinity, the epidemic behaves according to certain uh, uh, suitable branching process. And then uh, I'm sure that there are many people here that knows a lot about branching processes. So if you count the number of alive individuals in terms of the epidemic, that is the number of infectious individuals. So the branching process, you talk about giving birth. In the epidemic, you talk about infecting people and alive individuals in the branching process corresponds to uh, infectious people in the epidemic. So it is known that in the beginning, the number of infectious people grow exponentially at some rate r and that is the malthusian parameter and it is the solution to the euler lotka equation which looks like this and we see that both r naught and the generation time distribution determines the exponential growth rate so if you have a generation time distribution which is short you have a quicker growth and if you have a basic reproduction number, which is large, you have a quicker growth. And of course, conversely for the other direction. This means that if we know the generation time distribution, we can estimate the basic reproduction number 
if we observe the exponential growth. So quite often you have a histogram of reported number of cases or a histogram of the uh, case fatalities over time. So from that you can estimate, uh, from data you can estimate the exponential growth rate. And if you by some other mean have information about the generation time, then you can use this euler lotka equation to estimate the basic reproduction number. And this is actually done. How do you estimate the generation time distribution? That is a complicated thing. Quite often it is done using contact tracing, but there is a high risk for making mistakes if you estimate the, uh, the generation time distribution from contact tracing. So for instance, for Ebola, they identified uh, infected people and they tried to find out when they were infected and by whom. And then they know, okay, you showed symptoms yesterday and you were infected uh, 10 days ago. And then that means that the incubation period was uh, 10 days for that individual. And then you repeat this procedure, but there are a lot of uh, pitfalls you can fall into. So, but that is also another part of another talk. Uh, uh, and you can look in this paper that I contributed to, but also many others, Valinga Tunis is another one, Oke Svensson is another one. So there's a lot of work in that area. As an illustration, quite often the generation time is assumed to follow a gamma distribution with parameters alpha and beta say, then the euler lotka equation simplifies to this. So from here we see that if we observe the exponential growth rate and we know what is uh, uh, which gamma distribution we have, so we know alpha and beta, that gives us an estimate of R0. So let me just try to illustrate this uh, for COVID-19. I've looked in the literature. I've not been involved in estimating this myself, but um, I've seen papers where they estimate, uh, assume that it's a gamma distribution, the generation time with mean 6.5 days and standard deviation five days. Let's assume this generation time applies to all countries. Probably there are small differences, but I would say that the generation time is more mostly dependent on the virus. So there's less reason to think that it should vary between different countries. What does vary between different countries is the rate at which you have contact with others. So then we assume that this is the generation time distribution and then let's estimate the country specific exponential growth rate in the following simple way. We look at how many, uh, we look at the cumulative number of case fatalities that you can find in many sites. Worldometer is one of the sites. And uh, I did this in the following way. I started the clock the first day when at least 50 people had died in the country. And I continued 14 days uh, and I looked how many people had died 14 days later than this. So the first day I called uh, C0, so the number of case fatalities, days zero, it could be 51, uh, 59 or something like that, it's the first day. And then I see how many people had died in total 14 days later, then the estimate of the exponential growth rate is simply this. Uh, has this expression, uh, easy expression, the division by 14 comes from the fact that we look at what happens during 14 days. Uh, so I did this for uh, several countries in uh, Europe, which you will see on the next slide, and the typical times were uh, the first half of March to the end of March, but it was also always 14 days. Italy was a bit earlier and the other was, why did I choose these numbers, by the way? Well, I did that because when 50 people have died, up somewhere around 5,000 to 20,000 people have been infected. I don't know exactly, that depends on the um, infection fatality risk, but somewhere in this ballpark of people have been infected. That's when I start the clock. And then I see what happens up until 14 days later. So at least it's not in the very, very beginning of the epidemic because during the very, very beginning, often special things happen. So I try to avoid that. That's why I started only when 50 people had died. And then I went on. So I will skip Norway and Denmark. I will not talk about that. 
uh, because uh, they had two very few case fatalities, so I did something different from them, but I will not talk about that, so don't look at those numbers. So focus on these five numbers. Uh, sorry, five countries. I write the countries uh, within brackets or uh, uh, within quotation because I don't think it applies to all of Sweden, for instance. In the beginning, it was only in Stockholm, or more or less only in Stockholm, that uh, people got infected. So maybe it should, it's better to write Stockholm here. I'm sure that in northern Sweden, the basic reproduction number is very different from this. Anyway, using the generation time distribution that I told you, this generation time distribution, and this estimate of R0 where I took these numbers from Worldometer and this euler lotka equation, I got an estimate of R0 looking like this. So for Sweden, the basic reproduction number was eight, estimated to 2.5. Germany and Belgium, I, all, I have all countries in, in quotation because I don't know exactly where the beginning of the epidemic took place. But I don't think it's the same all over the country. Anyway, Germany and Belgium seem to have around the basic reproduction number around three, UK 3.5, and the biggest was Spain, which had a basic reproduction number 4.3. The last column is called the, vac the critical vaccination coverage. Uh, I will come back to that later, but it is the fraction that you would have, if these are the basic reproduction numbers, it's the fraction that you have to immunize before the epidemic comes in order to avoid a major outbreak. So why is it? So, so if, if you on average infect 2.5 persons, if you vaccinate 60% of them, only 40% are still susceptible. So then 2.5 is multiplied by 0 0.4, which gives the value one. So that is the critical vaccination coverage. And similarly in Spain, you would have to vaccinate as much as 77% in order to obtain critical vaccine, uh, herd immunity. Herd immunity means that also the others are protected because there will be no big outbreak. Now let's talk a little bit about the heterogeneous community. Several of the results I said earlier still apply. Uh, one big difference is that R0 now has a, a different interpretation. Now R0 is, should be interpreted as the tip, uh, sorry, it is the average number of infection caused by a typical individual during the early phase of the epidemic. What do I mean by typical individual? Well, if you have different types of individual, of course, uh, types that are more uh, numerous should give, be given higher weight, but also types that are more likely to get infected should be given higher weight. Uh, and for instance, if you categorize uh, individuals into uh, um, different types, then you comp can compute the mean offspring matrix where MIJ denotes the number of J individuals that one I individual infects during the early stage of the epidemic. And then from branching process theory, the basic reproduction number is the largest eigenvalue to, these matri to this matrix. It's more complicated, as I said earlier, if you have local or spatial structures, I will not talk about that. Uh, uh, it's rather pedagogical to think of this is, applies to homogeneous case, but I think it's also partly applicable to a heterogeneous scenario. Uh, it's, uh, it's instructive to think of R0 as a product of three different quantities. It is the average number that you infect, but you can think of it that that is the probability to infect someone if you have a contact multiplied by the rate at which you have these contacts, multiplied by the length during which you are infectious. Everything in, in terms of means. So in particular, if you want to uh, insert some preventive measures, you can sort of attack either one of these three factors, or of course you can also attack all three, and you want to reduce them. So how do you reduce the probability of transmission given at contact? Well, for COVID-19, it could perhaps be wearing a face mask, 
uh, for STIs, it is wearing a condom. So there are different ways of reducing P. How do you reduce the rate of contact? Well, for instance, social distancing is one way of reducing the rate of close contacts. How do you reduce the length of the infectious period? Well, if you identify infected people quickly and isolate them, of course, they are still infectious, but from a spreading point of view, they stop being infectious if they are isolated. So that would shorten the, the effective infectious period. So suppose that we are able to reduce uh, by, by means of different preventive measures, suppose we're able to reduce R0 by a factor C. So C is the reduction. So one minus C is the remaining part of the reproduction number. That means that with these uh, preventive measures, we have what you might call an effective reproduction number. And it equals the original one multiplied by one minus C. So one minus C is the, the remaining fraction of contacts that had not been taken away due, uh, from preventive measures. Using exactly the same theory, it is then possible to show that if this new effective reproduction number is smaller than one, then you will avoid an outbreak. And if the outbreak has already started, when you insert the preventive measures, then once you insert them, if this holds, then uh, the epidemic will decline and soon, soon it will uh, vanish. So this equation corresponds to uh, this equation. So uh, I said this equation is probably the main reason why it's important to know what R0 is. It suggests how much efforts we need, how much effort we need to put in in order to uh, prevent or stop an outbreak. So this was under in the homogeneous case. Now look, let's look at, whoop. yes, okay, uh, let's continue with the homogeneous case. And now let's also include immunity. Uh, probably most of you know that Stockholm did not, uh, sorry, Sweden did not have a, a complete lockdown. I'm talking about Stockholm here and not because uh, I come from Stockholm, but because my estimate uh, was for Stockholm rather than for all of Sweden. So I think that uh, in Sweden we had quite a lot of uh, voluntary preventive measures which clearly reduced the reproduction number, but I think it reduced it not, it did not reduce them down below one, is my guess. So still we probably had the effective reproduction number larger than one. <coughs> And we did see a growth even after the uh, preventive measures were put in place. But then as the epidemic grows, immunity builds up. Uh, and then once immunity builds up, more and more of the contacts that people have will be with already infected people. So after some time T, the effective reproduction number is the original one multiplied by the, rem uh, or reducing uh, uh, by a factor C due to pre the preventive measures, but then we have to multiply by the fraction of susceptibles as well. And if we, st we start with everyone being susceptible, but this thing is declines, so eventually, as more and more people get infected, this quantity de declines, and these are independent of uh, time, if we keep the restrictions on, that is. So eventually, this quantity will drop down below one because S of T becomes smaller and smaller. And whenever this happens, the epidemic will start declining. And after some time, it will vanish or stop, more or less stop. I think currently in Europe, this is a situation in, in all of Europe now. It is definitely the situation in Sweden on, on a national level. There are probably a few regions uh, where uh, you have uh, effective reproduction or a daily in, 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 in reproduction number, which is larger than one, but we are clearly on the decline now. Um, 
Okay, so that uh, uh, was this about, uh, so these are effective reproduction. I mean, there is a little uh, um, confusing uh, terminology here. Um, people talk about the re effective reproduction number. Some people denote this by the effective reproduction number. So some people do not include the effect of immunity when they say the effective reproduction number. Whereas, whereas others also include the effect of immunity. So they would call this the effective reproduction number. I don't know what is better, but uh, some other people use um, uh, the current or the daily reproduction number for this quantity where you also take immunity into account. So I would prefer using today's reproduction number or the daily reproduction number, because then it, at least to me, it is clear that then you both include the effect of preventive measures, but also the effect of immunity. How about the situation when you uh, have a heterogeneous community? So here is a bit more, less mathematically rigorous notation. Let I of T somehow represent the composition of individuals that get infected around T. So I, I of T is not, script I of T is not the number of infected, but sort of it represents the typical composition of individuals getting infected at time T. Then if you have a heterogeneous community, the daily effective reproduction number is very similar to before. The only difference from the previous expression was that here I have a script I of T and here I have a script I of T. So this R naught I of T is then how many people those who get infected today would infect if there was no preventive measures and no immunity. And those that get infected today may not be of similar type as those that got infected three months ago. So that is important thing that also the basic reproduction number depends on who you consider and uh, the original basic reproduction number was for those getting infected early on, but this is the reproduction number among those that get infected around time t. And uh, I'll skip the s thing. And it is clearly the case that ne for nearly all epidemic models, the people that get uh, infected early on typically infect more individuals than people get in infected later in the epidemic. The reason for this is that typically the socially and outgoing people are the ones that get infected early. So they, when they get infected, they infect more people, but later on it is the less social people that get infected, so they have a smaller reproduction number. So if you start if you compare a homogeneous community with a heterogeneous community having the same initial R0, then later on in the epidemic, the heterogeneous case will have a smaller reproduction number. So the people getting infected later on in the epidemic in the heterogeneous model will uh, produce fewer infected than uh, the homogeneous one would. Because the homogeneous one does not depend on T. So here is a plot of the number of infected people over time for a homogeneous model and here is a heterogeneous model. I think, yes, here it is. Both of them had R0 equal to 2.5. If I remember correctly, the heterogeneous model I, I, I chose to plot was one where half the community was twice as susceptible uh, uh, compared to the other half. There is also difference in the final size for these two situations as well. Now some words about herd immunity. So now we are approaching the, the new result which I talked about. So when the daily reproduction number drops below the value one, the epidemic will decline and eventually, or quite soon, die out. Probably doesn't die out completely, but transmission drops quite quickly after this. Um, which means that whenever this happens, the people that have not yet been infected will 
not exactly when this happens, but soon thereafter, they will also be protected because transmission stops. So this means that with the current measures put on and given the epidemic up until now, there is sufficient immunity in the community for the epidemic to die out, thus protecting those that are not yet infected. So whenever this happens and fixing the preventive measures, it means that immunity is high enough for, to protect the susceptibles. But this is not called herd immunity. Herd immunity is a situation where there are no preventive measures in place. So the question relating to herd immunity is, are we safe if we go back to normality? And going back to normality in terms of preventive measure means that we set C equal to zero. That is the question relating to herd immunity. Whenever this is the case, the immunity level is big enough for the current preventive measures. But then the question is, can we go back to normality? Then this is not enough. Then you have to uh, do some additional analysis. A related question to this is, suppose we are in this situation, then uh, many countries ask uh, nowadays ask, because all countries are in this situation now, and many countries ask, how much back towards normality can we go such that we still have the daily reproduction number smaller than one? Because you want to keep this, whenever this goes, exceeds one, uh, there is risk for a new second wave. Uh, now some words about the classical herd immunity, which I discussed also in the beginning when I showed the table of the reproduction numbers and the, the classical herd immunity level. So this is an old result. I don't know who, who should be contributed, but I know it is in the very famous uh, book by Anderson and May from 1991. And I'm sure that these two authors have written about it in the 80s, but maybe it's earlier. I should know my history, but I don't. <clears throat> anyway, the result is uh, the following that whenever the effective reproduction number is smaller than one, there will be no outbreak. That's for clear, for sure, which means that if this fraction is immunized, uh, there will be no outbreak. Or in terms of vaccination, if we vaccinate individuals uniformly in the community, assuming a perfect vaccine, Whenever we vaccinate a bigger fraction than this, the whole community will be protected. So we have what's called herd immunity. If we vaccinate this fraction or more, we will have herd immunity. For instance, for measles, R0 is of the order is about 15. So one minus one over 15 is about 93%. And I know that the Swedish health agency has a goal uh, uh, to every year vaccinate at least 95% uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the kids born that year. So that guidance with 95% relates closely to this expression and the estimate that R0 is equal to 15. So that's a called the critical vaccination coverage. This was under the assumption that you vaccinate uniformly, but if you have a heterogeneous community, you can of course do much better you can sort of vaccinate optimally. And if you put your vaccines, um, if you choose the people to vaccinate in an optimal manner, you will mo most likely be able to get away with vaccinating fewer than this. A well-known result uh, uh, in the beginning of the era with networks uh, was uh, by Pastor Satoras and Vespignani who considered so-called scale-free social networks. And they uh, concluded that if, you, if your network is scale-free, you have to vaccinate close to everyone in order to avoid an outbreak. Whereas if you uh, pick your uh, in the, uh, vaccinees in an optimal way, you can get away with vaccinating hardly anyone. So in a scale-free network, there's a big difference between uniform vaccination and optimal vaccination. But also in reality, uh, you can do better than uh, uniform vaccination. 
but the classical result is when you vaccinate individuals at, uh, randomly. So this is the expression for herd immunity, the classical expression for the herd immunity level or the herd immunity threshold. <clears throat> so uh, now to COVID-19. Uh, the people, the relevant herd immunity question for COVID-19 is the following, and I want to stress that I think this is the first time that this type of question has ever been posed. And it's the following, how many people must have been infected during a mitigated epidemic outbreak in order to avoid a second epidemic outbreak or a second wave once we lift all the preventive measures? I think uh, there has never been, uh, at least on a global scale, an epidemic where, where all countries have changed their behavior in either a mitigated or a lockdown uh, scenario. So I think this, the reason why our result is new is I think that this uh, question has never been posed earlier. So the scientific scenario that we have looked at is uh, considering the COVID-19 outbreak in a country that has mitigation or lockdown and gradually exit towards normality, then the question is, when will herd immunity kick in? Uh, assuming that we know what R0 is. And in my illustration, I will take R0 equal to 2.5, but that's just an illustration. What is the answer? Well, one answer, the first sort of obvious guess would be that the answer is that we should, uh, this will happen when 60% get infected, because if you insert 2.5 here, you get 60%. That's a classical herd immunity. And this is what has been written in nearly all scientific papers that, there's no reason, it's impossible to wait to herd immunity because it's such a big fraction that has to get infected. Uh, so our result is that actually herd immunity will kick in earlier than this, because this is not correct uh, if immunity is achieved from disease spreading, because when immunity is obtained through disease spreading, uh, uh, the people that get infected tend to be the socially outgoing people and perhaps also the highly susceptible people. So the people not getting infected are the less socially active and the less susceptible individuals. So in, in a sense, the immunity is, it's not distributed in an optimal uh, fashion but it's not distributed uniformly, so it is distributed somewhere between the optimal fashion and the uniform fashion. So for that reason, in, you need less immunity in overall in order to obtain herd immunity. As, and our conclusion is that uh, it's a st substantial difference. We, uh, we have a model, which I will just describe now, uh, which is not claimed to be the, the, the true model, but anyway, for that model, Rather than 60%, the herd immunity threshold is around 40 to 45%. Gabriela Gomez at Liverpool University and her group uh, uh, published a, a related or qualitatively similar result independently. They were two days before us on MedArxive, but they had a rather different model. They only, vary, they only looked at variable susceptibility, and their conclusion was that if the susceptibility varies a great deal, then the herd immunity level could be as low as 10 to 20 percent. None of us claim that these are the true values, but we just illustrate saying that there is a substantial reduction in herd immunity when it is obtained through uh, a disease-induced uh, immunity. I think I will skip this slide because I more or less said it. So the, the, the reason is that immunity is more efficiently distributed when it is obtained through disease um, than if you would vaccinate individuals at random. And this has been well known that after an outbreak, uh, immunity is more efficiently distributed. That has uh, some old results. I didn't put the years here, but I think this is in the 70s or 80s. This is 80s, so it's been known for a long while. But it seems to us that no one except us and Gabriela Gomez realized that this is useful uh, 
in this mitigation suppression situation that we are all under right now. So here is a model. We have six age groups and we have mixing structure according to a social study done by Jakob Alinga and others. So we take the social structure from a published group on social, uh, where they have sort of measured how people interact with each other. And then within each of these age group, we categorize individuals into three different types. We say that 50% of them are, have normal activity, 25% have low activity and 25% have high activity. And those with low activity, they meet others half as much as the normal one. And the people with high activity meet others at the rate which is twice as those of the normal activity. This is of course a simplification and we don't claim that this to be the true. I don't know if reality is more heterogeneous or less heterogeneous. So that is up to discussion and I hope that others will continue this work to try to fit it to reality better. Anyway, somehow this sort of mimics network characteristics in the sense that some individuals are more connected to others and others are less connected. R0 will be the dominant eigenvalue of this matrix. We have actually, we have three groups of each of these groups. So it's an 18 type model and we have an 18 by 18 matrix and R0 is a dominant eigenvalue. And then let's assume that preventive measures are put in place and we assume that everyone, all the types reduce their contacts by the same factor C. Rather than talking about C, I will talk about one minus C. So alpha is the remaining uh, uh, fraction of contacts. So it's an important assumption we make that everyone reduces their contacts at the same uh, uh, level. Uh, what happens if we start restrictions already from the beginning and have it to the end until the epidemic is over? That is illustrated in the following table. And in particular, we say, we do it for different values of alpha. If we set alpha equal to one, for instance, then there is no reduction, then we will have a big outbreak. But after the outbreak is over, there will not be a second wave. Whereas if we take a very small value of alpha, there will be a very small outbreak. But then when we set alpha back to one, there will be a big second outbreak. So we investigated what is the threshold here at which there will be no second outbreak. And then we investigate how many people will have been infected if we use this particular choice of alpha. And here comes the table. So I will focus here when R0 is 2.5 and when we have both these structures, the, the fraction getting infected at the optimal level of reduction is 43% as compared to 60% if you had immunized individuals uniformly in the community. Finally, or no, not finally, but close to finally, I see my time is uh, soon out. Uh, we looked at, suppose now that we did not do it from the start to the end, but that maybe it started February 15, we inserted the restriction momentarily uh, one month later, and then we stopped the restrictions momentarily uh, June 30. Then it looks like this. Here is a curve for no restrictions. Here is a curve for moderate restrictions, medium restrictions, and harsh restrictions. So this is over time and the next slide is the accumulated. So we see that if we have very hard restrictions and then we suddenly lift them here, then there will be a big second wave. Whereas we, if we have less restrictions, there will no, be no big second wave. And we see that if you look at the accumulated number, which is a little bit surprising, we will see that the purple curve actually ends up at a higher level than the yellow curve. So it means that if we have hard restrictions and then drop them suddenly, of course, this is not very realistic, very realistic, but then there will be a big second wave. So there will be an overshoot. So you will actually, uh, this purple line is never better than the yellow line because you have hard restrictions, harder restrictions than the yellow and you end up with more people getting infected. And then 
<clears throat> we also looked at the situation where you, rather than uh, letting the restrictions go momentarily, we do, uh, let them go gradually. And that is this situation, and we see that even here, so I hear restrictions were lifted gradually from June 1 to August 30. Even here, the yellow curve was better, but you see that the difference is much smaller. So if you would have taken the period even longer, the, these two would have uh, coincided. Anyway, here we see that approximately 45% get infected. Uh, the reason that it's not 43, which I claimed, is that the preventive measures were all inserted only after one month. My last slide, to conclude, uh, the result, our main result is that the disease-induced herd immunity is substantially lower than the classical herd immunity level. How much lower that we don't know, important to find out. How about other uh, heterogeneities? If you have households, if you have schools, workplaces, spatial things and stuff. We have sort of considered this little bit, little bit but not rigorously, and we think that most of these have the effect that the difference will get even bigger. How about if you have non-proportional restrictions? So some groups change their behavior more and others less. One such situation is the isolation of elderly. I think that has the effect that the difference becomes even bigger. But school closing is another thing. There I, we don't know what the effect will be and others we don't know. Another difference is uh, how about if the socially active people are the ones that change behavior the most? Well then, that, if that is the case, the difference between classical herd immunity and disease-induced herd immunity will actually become smaller. So there are a few situations where it becomes smaller, but also several where the difference actually becomes bigger. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I don't know how much time you have now, but uh, I have people already who want to comment upon the lecture. So should we just go on? Yes. Okay, so uh, Pascal Maillard, could I ask one of those who uh, can handle the discussion forum to unmute him? I, I think it's okay. I think I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay, um, thank you very much, Tom, for, for a wonderful talk. Um, uh, I was wondering whether you could combine your results with uh, the results from another paper. So there is a recent paper by uh, people from the Toulouse School of Economics, uh, Miklos, Spiro, and Weibull. Um, so there they looked at a homogeneous population and they looked at different ways of how you can uh, 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 change the, the the transmission so different ways of uh, uh, restrictive measures and um, so what in particular they looked at what is the optimal way to uh, to uh, use uh, restrictive measures if you have a constraint for example on the number of uh, ICU beds and uh, if I remember well they also got different immunity levels at the end, uh, depending on uh, how you use restrictive measures. So maybe this could be combined with your results on heterogeneous populations um, to say a bit more about uh, how uh, you can get various uh, different immunity levels with various different uh, measures. Thanks. Uh, that sounds interesting. So. Uh... I'm aware of one paper of similar form to the one you mentioned, which has a Swedish author and some French authors, and the Swedish author is Jürgen Weibel. Is that the paper you're talking about? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, I just okay, put then, the uh, archive link uh, in the chat. Yeah, okay. So then uh, I have re I've looked at that paper, which I think is very interesting. I was surprised that it the resulting optimal strategy is very obvious to me, but the proof is uh, something like 25 pages, which surprised me. Uh, but I'm sure that they ha there is no simpler proof, at least I couldn't come up with one, but the, the optimal solution was not very surprising, but the proof uh, seemed to be rather uh, complicated. Uh, but I think you're right that it, it, I haven't thought of it, but maybe that could be compi combined with also considering heterogeneities. I will give that a thought. I've had some contact with this, this Swedish author, so I can uh, get back to him uh, with that. Thanks for the advice. <laughs>
Further questions? You can either put your hand up or you can write it in the chat box. Okay, I, I have a question, I guess. Yes, please uh, go. So, uh, hi. Um, so my question is what happens in, in the last picture when you showed the, the effect of different, the lifting the in interventions, what would happen if you would lift them, not at a specific moment in time, but uh, for, the, for all interventions, but um, at a stopping time, which is, uh, let's say, related to, you know, how much uh, the system has uh, recovered. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be in line with the previous comment that here we looked at the simple, simple case where all, uh, all these different uh, levels of prevention stopped at the same time. We didn't claim that this was uh, the natural thing to do, but I mean, if, if a particular country follows the uh, orange or the red trajectory, then the question is, of course, for them, when should we lift our restrictions? And, and the answer for the yellow one should not be the same as the red one. You're completely right, but we did not address this in detail. All right, interesting for the research, I yep. guess. Okay, any further questions? I think there's a hand up of uh, Tiziano. Pardon? Tiziano has, has his hand up. Uh, Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my question is, uh, how can you estimate alpha for a specific uh, level of measures that you are carrying out? That's a good question. I have not been involved in this, and uh, I think it's quite complicated. But, but what uh, people do, and in particular, the, uh, I didn't say this, but the, the, the biggest group in this area is the group at Imperial College. So uh, there are a lot of different preventive measures in different countries. And in some countries they close school, in other countries they uh, close restaurants. So by combining the effect in different countries, they try to get estimates of the, the effect of different preventive measures. I think the, the, the aim of this is very good, but I think it's very, uh, there, it's very complicated, so I wouldn't, there is a lot of uncertainty in that. One uncertainty is that it assumes that all countries are similar. The sec, oops, that was my alarm that in three minutes from now, I start teaching, so I will be brief, but I can be a couple of minutes late for teaching is all right. The second problem is that these effects are assumed to be additive in the sense that what is the effect of closing school? Maybe that is uh, alpha equal to 0 0.1. Uh, sorry, C is equal to 0 0.1. What is the effect of closing restaurants? Maybe that is also uh, C is equal to 0 0.1. And then in their model, the effect of closing both had the effect of 0 0.2. And I, I'm not sure that this applies to all type of preventive measures. So there are a lot of efforts to try to estimate the amount of alpha, but it's quite hard. Another way to do it is to see how it affects, I think maybe that is a, an alternative, maybe easier way is to see, okay, before restrictions, we could estimate R naught, and then we put in restrictions, and then we can see sort of the decline in the, in the growth rate, and from that you can estimate alpha. That is an alternative way. So estimating uh, from data, basically. Yes, I think uh, yeah. it, 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 also, it always has to be from data, I think. Now, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Also, in effect, uh, countries are different among each other. So it's uh, maybe more uh, sensitive to, to estimate from the data of uh, each country. Thank I you. Think, I think it's more, uh, I, I agree with you there. But for instance, I mean, it's not visible here. Maybe I should zoom up. But sort of in principle, you suppose you, whoops, I have to make it smaller. I, I switched slide even, sorry. Uh, so here, 
So before restrictions, you have one exponential growth rate. And suppose you are a country with a yellow curve. And then after restrictions, you have a, a new exponential growth rate here in the beginning. And by comparing these exponential growth rates and, and knowing what the generation time distribution is, it is possible to estimate the effect of the preventive measures. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then thank you all. I will I'll unmute just before you go, Tom. I'm going to unmute everyone and give them a chance to uh, clap for you in the traditional yes. manner. So after yeah, three. Yeah. One, two, three. In the state. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have teaching, so I will miss Anne-Marie's uh, talk. Okay. Andreas, can you see my slides? Yes, slides are good. Great. Whenever you're ready, Peter, you can kickstart. I think the numbers are stable, so I think it could be much whenever you want. <laughs> 